Welcome to the 21st century. and welcome to this interview edition of the Electronic Cafe. This is the episode where Mark and I got to spend some time chatting to the rather fabulous Neil X, one of the founder members of ZZ Sputnik, does a ton of work and been um, the guitarist for Mark Arman for many, many years um, and lots of other stuff um, he's been involved with. Uh, the stories about him doing the first album with the band with Georgia Moroda, for example, are absolutely brilliant. So uh, sit back and enjoy this fantastic chat that we had with the say the absolutely brilliant Neil X. Enjoy. There he is. There he is. Crashed. Sorry, mate. I just talked. I got your lovely conversation. Just <laughs> boom, crashed. I went, what the? Yeah, we, we said that you was getting boring, so we just binge it. Welcome to another interview edition of the Electronic Cafe. We are joined by an absolute legend, the brilliant Neil X. Neil, welcome to Electronic Cafe, my friend. It's so good to have you here. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the Electronic Cafe. Thank you, buddy. Uh, and look, uh, uh, obviously, uh, me and Mark were doing not much research. We know so much about you. We're big fans, but we watched one of your great videos of uh, Love Missile back in the day and the tube interviews and stuff. Yeah, you, know, you came sort of crashing through the scene that time as real pioneers. Uh, were, you, were you aware of the impact you guys were make? Because I remember just reading about you guys all the time and when you guys sort of did your deal and burst on the scene. Were you... I mean, I, th- I think looking back, there wasn't a lot going on, really. That first wave of kind of the brilliant, creative 80s electronic music, golden age of pop, we're calling it, the second golden age of pop, that had kind of died down by mid eighties, and it was all kind of D- D- Dave Lee Travis's novelty records on top of the pops. There was nothing really very exciting going on, and we were like, I guess you know, we were colourful, and we 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 believed all that stuff. You go, it's, you, it's all about the look. You've got to have a look, and then the sound has got to be totally original and idiosyncratic. Prince used to say he strives for originality in his work, and we thought we've got to do that. And there's no point in just copying what's going on around us. So we went, we were kind of, I guess, back to the trend where we looked back to the 50s and the birth of rock and roll and tried to re- recreate what we felt would happen if you had electronic instruments and did that. There was an anniversary this week, wasn't there, about your appearance on Top of the Pop? It was 37 years since the Sputnik sing- first Sputnik single, Love Missile, F-111, came out. Wow. Is that it, was recorded, it, it was recorded 37 years ago. I can't remember what date we recorded it on, but we'd given it a go by ourselves. With Sputnik, we got the deal based on demos we'd done ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had an 808 drum machine. And we had this synth. I've got the original synth here. I'll show it for your, your viewers. 
that's our original oh. sequential circuits pro one which back in the day cost about 200 quid they're now worth quite a bit yeah, and that's, all, that's we had that linked up to an 808 drum machine that was the sound the raw sound of sputnik that's all we had it's got a sequencer in it but it's only a 20 note sequencer <laughs> hence the simplicity of the bass lines the songs were like you say they were based on like rock and roll wasn't they i mean they, it was like yeah, I mean, that was our love and we went back we looked at we looked at old rock and roll records we looked at little richard in the girl can't help it we watched all the elvis films and we listened to eddie cochran so that was what was that was like what we were feeding ourselves so obviously that's what comes out you know it wasn't so we weren't really listening to our contemporaries yeah the cramps aside maybe we did listen to a lot of cramps but they were they were plowing you know they were going through the same stuff i think I remember, I mean, me and Andy were in bands, and I remember I was, I was on synthesizers and samplers and stuff, and hearing what you guys were doing with the sound bites, and I guess big audio dynamite at the same time were kind of putting those snippets in, in in between the songs. It was kind of like, you know, it's quite mind blowing, really, that no one had done that before, and it was in the early days of sampling. I mean, it was really pre-sampling on our, uh, so we we made a demo at home. And we did the demos at Tony's flat on that. Wow. With the 16 notes of the 20 note sequencer. <laughs> get a try, you know, you had to sort of, it wasn't a one take thing. It wasn't like a computer where you just push play. You had to physically move stuff <laughs> to get things in time and to change the patterns and things. You know, you can move the control, sweep the controls as you go and that stuff. So it was quite an, a, an amazing organic sound. interview with Tony when he was talking about the formation of uh, Zig Zig Sputnik and he said I think I'm right in saying this it was just you and him to start with yeah and the yeah. look was the look was as important as as the music so you used to walk around looking for people that looked the part for it and you was kind of living the you know there was a constant uh video plan in in Tony's place your rehearsal place of you know all the stuff that became like a Zig Zig Sputnik video, you know, like the film, the eighties films and the space shuttle and all things like that. He said it uh, lived and breathed it. We did. Re yeah. We really did live, live the, live that kind of, you know, like fantasy world of our own creation. Yeah. Uh, if there had been a two eyes coffee bar, then we would have gone and hung out in it. You know, we, but then we would, we just go, where'd you start to look for someone? Where'd you find someone with charisma and a look and something extraordinary. Mm. And uh, we found Martin Degver. We were in Kensington Market one day and went into his shop and he just looked like, he really did look like an alien. You know, he looked really freaky. He's toned it down for public consumption with the group a bit. <laughs> but we thought he really had a look and he had an attitude and was different and exciting and interesting. So we thought, let's give it a go. So we we, we got him in. And uh, I remember him singing Bebop Alula on his first occasion. You know, and, he and Tony had the only two pairs of headphones, so I was sort of sitting on the couch behind the newspaper, you know, and Dave started singing. It's quite hard not to guffaw, but, you know, I suppose he wasn't the most natural, but he did work at it in those days, you know, and he, yeah. was, he had an interesting, uh, he had, you know, he was living an interesting life, but he knew cool people, he did cool stuff and was yeah. very creative yeah. designer. So it, it was it was a real natural, you know, a shoe in really. Mm. Yeah. Tony was in uh, Generation X before before that. Yeah. And he said that again, correct me if I'm wrong, he said that the, the demo tape that Sputnik took around was in fact a video was a video. Yeah. Rather than a normal, normal cassette with all the visuals that went with the song as well. So you, they were selling you to record companies on that basis we went we we, we made the demos of a little four track porter studio and then we made a demo video on two with two video machines linked together you copied the music onto one of them i don't know how we did it but we did and then tony sat there for days 
going, hold on, I just drop, hold on, let me rewind it a bit, hold on, you know, and physically dropping in from one machine to the next. And if you imagine you can't see what you're going on your recording machine until it's actually mm. recording. So there's a lot of trial and error, but eventually we have this little three and a half minute video, which looked amazing because it was bits of Clockwork Orange and Firefox yeah. with Clint Eastwood and stuff. Obviously not footage we can use, but to say this is the world which we want to represent. And that it was really exciting. That looked really great. Uh, and EMI said, this is fantastic. You've done the demo yourself. How do we make a record? And we said, well, we only really like Prince and Bowie of the current crop, so let's get them to make the record and produce the record, otherwise we won't bother making one. And so they went, well, we'll give it a go. And then they came back three months later and said, they don't want to do it, which was probably a lie, uh, since Prince told us that he never actually got any tape, so he didn't, you know, they said he's personally got it and turned it down, which wasn't the case. And Bowie, they said he'd heard it and uh, and passed on the opportunity, but it did cover Love Missile <laughs> later yeah. on. So we were a bit dubious about that. Anyway, EMI puts in the studio by ourselves because we couldn't think of anyone else. And it's a very big difference being in a big 24-track, 48-track recording studio when you know fuck all, really. <laughs> It's a very, very intimidating experience. Uh, and we came out after a week with nothing. And we're going, well, what are we going to do? We just pissed away all this money. It was really an awful situation. And our A&R man, Dave Ambrose, said, I know what, I'll speak to Giorgio Moroder. I think he'd be good for you. Wow. Oh, oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. He spoke to Giorgio. He seemed up for it. We got on a plane and went to Munich to meet Giorgio just for lunch. That was what the budgets were like in, back in the days. And uh, Giorgio said, yeah, I'm up for it. I think it's a really interesting record. It'd be really exciting. Yeah, so he came to London. We must have recorded it mid-January, I think. Right. And it came out mid-Feb. That was, you could do that in those days. Mm, yeah. Uh, and that's another thing that I, I really missed, that thing of you, you could make a record and you put it out a week later. Yeah. You know, and it was all about the let's get it out there if it's done, yeah. but not just sitting around for six months waiting for the right time and all that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, really exciting time, and we we never felt Love Missile was our strongest song, maybe, but we felt it was a really good blueprint for how the group should sound, and really had all the kind of ideas there. Sure. And, uh, it was a bit of a, a kind of a bit mystifying why it was such a big hit. You know, we we're kind of oh. Oh, bugger, we, we've got to follow that up now. Especially about how you guys got into that massive studio and didn't really know, but I'm guessing you must have learned a hell of a lot with uh, Mr. Maroder at the helm. Yeah, I mean he was he was extraordinary. I thought that you know we didn't know we didn't know any better, but he said, "Look, we finish at eight o'clock. We start at midday. We finish at eight. We said, "How will we start?" He said, "Well, my engineer and programmer are there already. I'm hoping they'll be finished by the time we get in." Wow. And we got in, and they were kind of they were already up and on it. And we said, "Look, we had terrible difficulties with MIDI." It's boring for the non-music interested people, but MIDI delays. This is the way that computerized in, uh, instruments in the digital age talk to each other via MIDI. They did, nobody tells you when you start out that there's different delays from different synths respond differently and all this. And his team went, oh no, no, we sorted all that. Oh, they, wow. they just knew they were just on top of all that. Wow. So what taken a week in the studio, we took a day barely with them to get a working thing. Then we put on the effects and we recorded the dub effects and the space echo and all that. I've got the original one over there, actually, the space echo buried under the rubbish. We still use that now. It was just really easy and really, really fast. And it showed that thing of be sure of what you do. Make, you know, make decisions, just be sure. Don't dwell on it too much and move on. 
Yeah. And Giorgio had this thing of like, I can't tell the difference and I'm a millionaire record producer, so the general public aren't going to know. It'll do. Let's move on. That was a perfect fit, though, really, wasn't it? Your sound at the time. Yeah. Because it was, he's done stuff with like Daft Punk. He's, he's done stuff with Duran Duran now. And it's like yeah. that kind of oh. sequ that sequence stuff is was ideal for your sound. It, perfect, really. I mean, it was interesting because we were, I don't know, we were, we were maybe never overjoyed with the seven inch version of our record. It sounded exciting. It represented what the group was. But Giorgio said, look, I'll do the 12 inch in LA. And he took the tapes to LA and he sent back what we thought was really mind blowing. You know, that first, the 12 inch record he made was a really extraordinary sounding record. I think still is, you know, it's really stands up today. I, and I would say that was that, you know, that really was Giorgio's mm. by himself. That was him showing us what, what ideas he had. I've got, yeah. I've got the album down there. I'll dig it out in a minute. But I remember at the time, you had adverts between the songs, didn't you? We did, yeah. And it's something that seemed a brilliant idea at the time. It was one of Tony's more controversial ideas, should we say. <laughs> I think, looking back, you might say we were a bit young, young and dumb and full of fun. And uh, it was a little bit, yeah, it was uh, maybe not something we would have done now, given how irritating ads are. Out of curiosity, were they paid adverts or were they just... They, uh, were, they were supposed to be paid adverts and I believe we got some money. And the idea, obviously, is if you go look, we got 10, 10 slots between tracks. We could sell each one for a grand in the UK and sell them for a different lot of advertisers in France and another yeah. lot in Germany. So you <laughs> could do it quite modest amounts, but there's a lot of countries that the record was released in. So if it, oh. we were out in 28 countries, you can go that... Potentially, it's a very lucrative thing. Unfortunately, we had had the bottle throwing incident and, and the front cover of the uh, News of the World with the horror of Sputnik Maniac and then more violence and controversy at gigs. All of the big boys that might have been interested, any of the kind of big soft drink manufacturers or whatever, yeah. all head for the hills very, very quickly then. <laughs> so it was a really a lost, a lost opportunity, but one that... I don't know. Would it have really worked? I don't know. I think it's it's you don't really. Yeah, it was it worked for Sputnik because we yeah. were over, over, you know overtly commercial. Yeah. But in the long run, it isn't wasn't really a viable thing. Well, I mean, who inspired you to become a guitarist? Usual things, I suppose. Mick Ronson playing with uh, David Bowie. Uh, Mark Bolan was a fantastic guitar oh. player. Yeah. And showed what you could do with just simple stuff done really well. Paul Kossoff. Yeah. The guys, both the guys that played with Alice Cooper, Dick Wagner and Steve Hunter, I absolutely love their stuff. Um, and the Alice Cooper band themselves. But I think I think the records were done by Steve Hunter and Dick Wagner. Or is it Wagner? I think it's Wagner, he's pronounced. I think Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> they were fantastic. You know, their, their work with Lou Reed was great. And growing up with that stuff, you know, if you think of the pop music of our day, when I, when I was 12, Ziggy Stardust came out and Mark Bonham was putting records out. And then Roxy Music were out like a year later. It wasn't 12-year-old music. It was proper art rock that we it but we all bought it so we were there was no kind of yeah. patronizing of younger audiences we got into really quite interesting and diverse music when we were very very young yeah, what right. a, you know a really great opportunity to do that it was a great yeah. period wasn't it i mean you take the 70s within a, a couple of years it literally went from glam rock to punk rock to yeah you know, with craft work in between yeah, with craft work in between, yeah, and the electronic revolution, yeah, all yeah. within the space of not even a decade. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a phenomenal education, really. It really is. If you look at just uh, a friend of mine who's living this year as if it's 1973, and posting about the music and films and culture of the time, 
And it's just extraordinary. It's brilliant. We were really, really privileged to grow up in that, that time, really lucky. You worked with Mark for a long time. Are you are you still working with Mr. Almond at the moment? I am. Yes, I was. Uh, that was a that was a weird one. Sputnik had sort of ground to a halt, really, in about nineteen ninety. Although yeah. we didn't get back together, we still we were still speaking at that time and everything. Yeah. But um, we were looking for other things to do, and Tony and I were considering doing another group. And uh, then Tony got an offer to join the Sisters of Mercy, and you know, obviously. I, you can't stop people. I'm, I'm really happy for you, Tony, but it did leave me a bit in the lurch. So I was sort of didn't really know what to do. And I was very aware having it, you know, having Sputnik taking so long to get together and so much effort goes in and energy goes in. Sure. It's an awfully big commitment. You've got to make sure it's right. And I couldn't find the right person that I wanted to work with. And uh, it was suggested by uh, a guy called Rob Dickens, who was the head of Warner Brothers at the mm. time, who said to me, I've got an idea for you, Neil. He said, I think, I know what I can do with you. I'll put you together with Mark Almond. That'll work. He said, trust me, you'll really get on. I was obviously a bit sceptical, thinking, well, I know Mark's working soft sell, but not really heard much from him for a while. And yeah. Rob said, that's why he needs you, because he needs to get back to his pop roots. And he felt that that's what I could bring to the table. We got. We had a week in the studio together. The first day, we wrote a couple of songs which we're still playing. In fact, I've just got yesterday. Mark was over. How was he? Or a day before yesterday, and he brought me this, which is the record we made back then. The wow. first album I was involved with, Fantastic Star, out on vinyl at last. It's on record store day, isn't it? It's on my on record store day, and that's an advanced copy. And I'm absolutely right. thrilled that that's out there. And again, it still sounds to me, it still sounds contemporary. You know, well, I love that. I love that album. Martin Ware appears on that album as well, doesn't he? Martin produced a couple of tracks for us yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was one of those. It was a. Uh, we started. We did the demos, and Rob. Dickens at Warner said, oh, "I love the demos. Hit records, really great. You've, you've, really, you know, you've lived up to my expectations." And then the next minute, Mark was off the label, and oh. Steve, -O, Steve -O had got his foot in there somehow. And then Mark was signed to another label, and then another label, and then the record was remixed. And oh, we better do bring something else to it. So it was fully two years later, with an awful lot of fiddling had gone on. Right. And so it doesn't really sound like a coherent record, maybe, but there's some brilliant tracks on yeah. it. I've got it's, it on CD. It's a different cover, I remember. It's a white cover on yeah, there. Yeah, the white cover, yeah. Which to harden your heart? What will I find when I look in your eyes? I'll find the beauty is all in your mind. Mate, uh, the Monte Cristos. I mean, I loved that album when it came out. Is is there more going on with that project, or is that just at the moment? It's kind of temporarily shelled. So I'm not quite sure what to do at the moment. But I've got it's a, it's a busy old year. So the next thing I've got a European tour with Mark on the 16th. Amazing. So it's a couple of weeks away, and realistically, we think that's the last proper tour he'll do he's saying he doesn't want to really do touring anymore do one-offs obviously and yeah. i could certainly you know you would hope it would be a playing l'olympia in paris with an orchestra you know and i'd like to be involved with that sort of thing with him yeah. and that's that's the sort of thing that he should be doing i think now not schlepping yeah. around clubs or whatever or small theaters it's really great and we love it but it is it is grueling yeah and Mark's a bit older than me, not much, but a little, little bit. It's a little bit older than me. It's you know, it does get harder. Of course, it does. It gets harder to justify. Certainly, you don't want to do it on a tour bus. You want to do it in comfort, and that's really expensive. So it's difficult to justify the effort for the return. Yeah, yeah. But it's really good fun and exciting. 
then I've got, a, I think, a few concerts with Glenn Matlock at the beginning of May. Oh, nice. And then very exciting one for me. I've been asked uh, to do a little Sputnik set at the Let's Rock the 80s festivals, which oh, I thought, that would be, that's out of the comfort zone, I'll do that. <laughs> so it's a short set. I'm going to do two or three songs. Uh, there's a house band provided. Drums, keys, bass, guitar, two backing vocals. And I'm going to do what I do in the middle. The Art and Noise play all those as well, don't they? And They've done a couple of them, yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really exciting thing to yeah. do. As I said, something different. And then I don't know after that. So in, in terms of the Monte Cristos, I don't know. After that, I thought I should be doing something of my own mm. yeah, again. Yeah, what, so uh, what about the Loveless? The Loveless, we were going to be do, doing a little tour. We've got an album <laughs> last year. That was going to come out early April, and we were going to tour around that. But unfortunately, our stellar... Uh, rhythm section can't make it. Uh, the bass player Ben is working as the front of house engineer for Wet Leg, which when right. he took on when he t a year ago, he was saying, Look, I'm working with this little indie band, I can just duck out anytime. It's not, you know, they won't mind it, only doing club shows. A year ago, they were thrilled that they sold out the 100 Club. They're now doing a world tour with Harry Styles. They're playing stadiums. They did four nights at the Forum in LA. They're doing five Wembley stadiums and they're doing Coachella. So it's kind of, you know, really big league. They're about wet leg, you know, double Grammy winners, double Brit Award winners. Yeah, you can't yeah, walk yeah. away from that. Uh, and Matt, the drummer, is doing some theatre work. I don't really know what it is, but he's doing a 10 week slot in the theatre which he couldn't turn down so we thought you know it's supposed to be a side project it's a bit of fun a bit of reliving our teenage rock selves so we've uh we've put that back to christmas i'll definitely be doing something i've you know i've been I'm constantly writing and recording and stuff mm, sure. i'm not sure if it's a new monte cristo's record or something else well, keep us posted. And if anything's about to come out, we'll always be happy to put it on our channel and tell people about it. So that's yeah, really sweet. And we're yeah. really keen to hear it, mate. You made me stronger every day. And I'll never Obviously, we saw you at the Jazz Cafe working with uh, JJ and the crew of the Art of Noise. How, how did that come about? <laughs> well, I've I've known Gary Langan from the Art of Noise since the 80s. He was one of the guys. We, we stalked him for a while. We wanted to work <laughs> with him so much. Uh, and I think he was a, just a fantastic engineer. You know, if you look at the the work Trevor Horn did, it's the sound of it is down to Gary. He was the engineer on the, the Yes record. Yes. Frankie records. I think he even did Dollar. You know, he was he was really had a great, great, great sound. Uh, I've been talking to Gary for eight years about doing The Art of Noise, and he's saying, you know, we, we need a guest guitarist, really. Would you be up for doing a couple of numbers? So I went, I'd be thrilled. Yeah, it'd be fantastic. And I've only met JJ recently through Gary and through working with The Art of Noise, but I really liked him as well. He was yeah. just, He's a fantastic, really super erudite, intelligent, funny guy. Yeah. It's a joy to be around, really. So I'm very keen to do more with them. And we've had some meetings and been talking about looking for further shows and stuff mm. to do. Uh, so I'm very much up for that. And it was terrific to play at the Jazz Cafe with them. And uh, sad that Anne Dudley didn't want to be part of it, I think. But mm. I read some reviews saying it's so good that Anne wasn't part of it because it meant, meant they could do that the Yes song, The Owner of a Lonely Heart, and that's where I got up. It was a real joy to play. A great sound that night. I mean, I remember it being, oh. like, with the visuals and everything, it was a great sound. I mean, your guitar sound on Peter Gunn fits perfectly, obviously. It's, like, right up your street. And I think you slotted in absolutely brilliantly. Yeah, amazing. Well, thanks very much. It was, I mean, it was all just really joyous working with yeah. them. Just, you know, we've done a lot on Zoom. 
and we did the music on a lot of the music and swapping ideas on Zoom using a program called Loopback, where you can play each other's digital devices. So they could play me their Pro Tools files over that. I could play what I was doing. I could play guitar and have it mic'd up in the room here, and they hear it in real time. It was really exciting. Well, we interviewed JJ, and he, you're right. He's a great, he's a great raconteur. He's really funny. Oh, it was hilarious that night. I thought in between the tracks as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's really, <laughs> he's got great communication skills. He worked as <laughs> a teacher for many years. Obviously, with all the stuff that you do, and do you get a chance to listen to lots of new stuff? Because we always ask our guests because we're all about sharing music. It's one of the reasons Mark and I started this in the first place. Is there anything new or? recent you've heard that's made your ears go oh i like that i mean there's loads of stuff i think if you look around there's probably lots of pap but there's loads of cool stuff at the wet leg for example we went to see them and we thought they were terrific live and i loved that single the chaise long sing which you know we heard it before it came out because we know another guy in their management i thought that was really good i thought all oh, that could be a minor hit obviously we didn't realize it was going to be such a big thing uh <laughs> And the first time, I thought I'd better check out this Billie Eilish girl, see what she's like, you know, because it's people are talking about it. And I had listened to that, and I thought well, she was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. first track I heard was that was when the party is over, and I just I was absolutely gobsmacked. I thought either they've got some somebody's brilliant with with uh, some kind of harmony uh, creating software, or she's. <laughs> It must take months to do this because it's all done with her voice. There's no keyboards on it. It's just her singing. Mm. And then I saw an interview with them. You know, they made it in the brother's bedroom, just two of them, on a little laptop. And they said, oh, it took months to do the singing. You know, she sang every single bit and harmonised it. And you go, that's extraordinary. She was like, you know, teenagers, 16, 17, to make that. I thought it was hats yeah, off. I thought it was a really great record. Yeah, it is. And... I have to say, I'm a big Taylor Swift fan at the moment. That was my, the, lo the lockdown album she did was my favourite record of, of lockdown year. You know, who would have thought a pop poppet writing this fantastic reflective record made at home, it again made at home in her bedroom. So it shows that it can be done. And I think, you know, she, her lyrics are int really interesting. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Got yeah. a good from the heart, you know, so, and... I remember reading things she said, I don't really think of myself as a singer, I think of myself as a poet. It was quite telling that it's, and she doesn't want anything to do with the record business, really. She's just really good at it. Where's he gone again? He, he works in tech, it probably, believe it or not. Is he timed out? No, I bloody postman turn up, and I just... Uh, All right. Grab that quickly, so sorry. I thought you had someone at the door, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> Well, uh, life gets in the way, doesn't it? That's the oh, thing. That's, God, that's the... And he has to coincide um, all his records being delivered for when his wife's out. Well, if you're into mu if you're into music, you buy it, don't you? That's the that's the thing because you have to support the acts. Hence, records everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Talking of records, I dug it out. They don't do it out. They don't do record yeah. sleeves like that anymore, do they? They don't. We did that one originally. It was done as a box, so it looked like a Japanese toy. Amazing. Amazing. And, and, and that as well. I mean, and that, that was they're, well. So, they're so striking and um, instantly recognisable. Well, I think that was that was part of it, is the artwork. You know, when records were made on a 12-inch a format, that's a very good restricted frame to do art in, isn't it? Hmm. it is. And so there's many different brilliant record covers, and that was a real big thing. It was, it was a well-funded well respected part of the music business yeah. and that's i think that's kind of gone now it's all a bit it when it's when it's, when it's this tiny little thing on spotify who cares oh. and let me see it smile the way is dark tonight and like a link child light my pathway You're probably the same, but I mean, we bought our records in probably early 80s when we started buying records. But I remember buying records on the strength of the sleeve alone, thinking that was yeah. interesting. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. 
it was a badge. You took your records to school in the clear plastic folder. Yeah, exactly. It showed which gang you belonged to. Exactly. <laughs> Generally, I belong to a gang where people would want to beat the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to learn to run really fast. Yeah. <laughs> the records I had, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Andy got chucked out of school once for wearing, do you remember Gary Newman wore the boiler suit with the red... With the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Was it a crossways one? Yeah, one going down and one going round. It was a black jumpsuit. I think Andy turned up at school one day wearing that, and the black, the t- teacher said, "You got to go. You got to go. You got to go." Then I had hair. Happy oh, days. I they were. The they days. were. They were. But as you tell me, you talk about Martin. I thought I've got. I used to go to Kens and Market and buy loads of clothes off him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what happened to Martin. I don't want to be speak disparaging about him, but no, no I won't. But I was just thinking before we, before we spoke today, I've not spoken to him for 20 years and I'm kind yeah. of, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. You know, it's not, it, it got so difficult. Uh, and it was, he, he wanted to be a rock and roll star. Of course, didn't everyone, but it felt like just as we get in the first, but on the first rung almost with Sputnik, he just stopped. It's like, that's it, I've made it. And it just it just became, you know, you can't carry someone. You need people that, to be their best all the time. And yeah. it just felt like he wasn't he was wasn't interested in yeah. the same mission, you know, and being part of the same thing. It just wasn't yeah. the thing. But you know, it's a, it was a moment in time that is still for me was a great moment in time. I mean, I was Shows what a nerd I am. I was excited to see. <laughs> oh, I was excited to see your old SSS flight case at the. <laughs> well, well, I've got a story there, Mark. Actually, that uh, somebody gave me a tip off. I can find his name if you like. Uh, somebody on Facebook tipped me off and said, "Oh, is this your amp for sale?" And I and a link, and I had a look at it, and it was on Reverb, I think, and Facebook Marketplace, and the guy's selling a Fender Twin in that flight case going, I think it used to belong to Zig Zig Sputnik, because if you look at the flight case, it's the same as the one in their videos. I emailed him and I said, it is my old amp. <laughs> yeah, that is my old amp. I wonder how you came by it, because I had two of them like that, and they were nicked out of storage from Easy Studios in North London oh, wow. in 1991, we figured out. He said, oh, I bought it off somebody in North London about 12 years ago. He said, I paid 600 quid for it. I said, well, can I give you that? I'll have it back off you. So I got it back off him. It's my original Fender Twin. I've had it serviced now. Wow. In the original flight case. And as we put the flight case in my car, when I went and bought it off him, bought it back off him, you know, because he he didn't nick it. You know, I didn't want it to be out of pocket. I went, oh, I'd, I'd forgotten, but there's all this pink paint showing through the red Sputnik colours. I thought, well, that's interesting to see that pink paint because it was a Clash flight case originally. And if we steamed ah. off the Sputnik paint, it would save the Clash. So it's wow. got a proper bit of rock and roll history there. So we were we were really good mates with, with Mick Jones. He was Tony's best mate from years before. And, uh, you know, Mick lent us that white guitar, the Sputnik guitar. Mm. He lent us his one, which he had in the Clash, and we f- we found one that looked the same, stripped off the paint, stripped off the original beautiful 1950s gold paint, and had it sprayed to look like Mick's one, so that for continuity. And Mick must have sold us this flight case for. Wow! Didn't Mick Jones buy Tony James's first guitar synthesizer that he used, they used in Spanish? He may well have done. I don't know if he gave him the money or bought it for him. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. It's nearly 40 years ago. I can't remember what happened last week. You know, uh, <laughs> oh, very probably, because we were broke. You know, Tony had come out of Gen X with a couple of guitars, but he had the, the classic thing of, you know, the management said, oh, there's no money left to pay your wages. And they get hold on. Gen X said, didn't we do a big deal? We've had top 10 singles. Where's yeah. all the dough gone? Yeah. And, you know, they, they looked into it, audited the manager, and found out that the manager spent all the money yeah. things like you know paying pay the wife's car insurance out yeah. and all that it's part of the thing i'm really looking forward to this summer i've got my original sputnik amp back Brilliant. got my original sputnik guitar over there in a case i've yeah. got my sputnik the space echo and i've yeah. now got 10 sputniks 
star gig, so I thought the time's right to maybe what revive. About, what about the outfit, though? You're going to wear the outfit. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. A f- Six different minds about what to do there, but I think a nice new pink suit could be the way, couldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you're in good shape. I think you're still, still got the hair. Look, that's still I could still yeah. put that. Up. Yeah, yeah. I know. well, some like it hot, and some like it cool. But like it or not, this is what you got. Space stage party that's never gonna stop. Real rock. And I think what's what people forget is that playing music and traveling and do playing music and meeting people and playing to audience, it's really energizing, it's really good fun. Yeah. It's really exciting for for the artists as well as the, the crowd, hopefully. Yeah. You can still hear it in your voice, like that excitement. It's lovely I, to hear me. I just love it. You know, the idea of going out at my age. I feel it's it's different. You get treated differently when you hit the big six <clears> O. <throat> you get looked at differently, and all the past crimes are sort of forgotten. And it feels like people are going, "That'd be really exciting. We'd love to see you do a couple of Sputnik songs." Well, we'd love to come and see you. Um, either Ooh, where where are you based? South we're End. Based, we're based in Essex. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we'd love to come and see you either doing the Sputnik thing or the Mark Harmon thing or. Monte Cristo's or Loveless or whatever. If you if you play some shows, I mean, give us a heads up, and we'd love to uh, come along, buy you buy you a beer, and say hi. Um, we'll do. I'll do a list for you. A yeah, long list you, of all yeah, I've got well, going on this year. Yeah, yeah send us a list. Um, but we'd love to come to one of those shows. Obviously, you're very welcome. Another thing, just before we go, another thing we're doing is uh, it was postponed from last year. We're doing a T-Rex or Mark Boland celebration concert to mark the 45th anniversary of his passing. And it was supposed to be September last year, but unfortunately, a few of the key people either had travel or health issues and we couldn't get it together. Um, So we postponed it till September the Friday, September the 15th this year at Shepherd's Bush Empire. We've got Tony Tony Visconti flying in to conduct the string section. Wow. Mark Harmon singing, doing his best Mark Bolan Bolan voice. Uh, Not sure, a few other superstar guests. Uh, It's a brilliant evening at Shepherd's Bush Empire. That sounds Uh, great. And that's my favourite venue in London, I think. It's a great venue, isn't it? You can see from everywhere, even right, from right up in the gods, you get a great yeah. view. I normally yeah. like level one on the balcony by the bar was really yeah, <laughs> yeah, a really, yeah. A really good view. But um, those tickets have gone. <laughs> 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 They're the expensive seats. They went straight away. All right, yeah. okay. but um, we look forward to Fantastic Star and Record Store Day and yep. catching up with you at some point and. Um, Thank you very much for giving your time up this morning. It's a great privilege for us to speak to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's been an absolute honour. And I apologise for the blackout on my Wi-Fi. But, uh, no, no problem. It's a pleasure. Always a joy to talk about myself. Fantastic. It's lovely speaking to you guys. Thank Thanks, you, mate. Neil. Thanks for your time. Bye, Bye now. Bye. Cheers. Bye. With dragon boys and geisha girls in twilight zones or secret So that's it for this episode of the Electronic Cafe. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation that Mark and I had with the fabulous Neil X. Neil, it was an absolute honour to have you on the show, my friend. We loved every second of it and we hope to uh, see you again soon. All right, everyone, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time on the Electronic Cafe. Thanks for watching the Electronic Cafe. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.